On this episode of the Global 20, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. We've got election results, flavor bans, lawsuits, the latest vape science, and a bunch of industry news. We've got a couple new products that are coming out, as well as Oxva is celebrating their third anniversary. So naturally, you know that they've got a big contest going on. And last, but certainly not least, we've even got a THR scholarship opportunity. So ain't nothing to it but to get into it. I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape, Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy News for the week ending 11 November 2022. On Tuesday, November 8th, all across the United States, it was Election Day. And despite the year being 2022, well, we still don't know who officially won a bunch of these races. But the good is, this election cycle is finally over. No more piles of election propaganda in the mail. No more constant advertisements on TV, radio, and the internet websites that we all visit. We can finally focus on something else. Or can we? We've just projected that Senator Mark Kelly will win the Senate race in Arizona, but the governor's race remains uncalled, at least for now. I want to bring in the chairman of the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, Bill Gates. Bill, thanks so much for joining us. Blake Masters, by the way, just made some allegations that ballots in Maricopa County, your county, have been mixed up. Listen to this. So people, when they uh, got to a machine and the machine didn't work, they were invited to just drop their ballot ballot in a secure box. Hey, we'll count this later. Well, it turns out Maricopa County, on at least two occasions, mixed up those uncounted ballots with ballots (laughs) that had already been counted. So it's a giant disaster. It's a giant mess to try to uh, un- unmix these ballots, right? I think the most honest thing at this point would be for Maricopa County to wipe the slate clean and just take all the ballots and do a fresh count. And the RNC, the Republican National Committee, just released a statement saying this election has exposed what they call deep flaws in Maricona, uh, Maricopa County's election administration. I want to get your response, Bill. Well, Wolf, thanks for having me. First of all, let's take the Blake Masters allegation. There were two vote centers where the um, ballots that went into that box three uh, were actually commingled with the ballots that went through the tabulator. Uh, Now, here's the thing. We can absolutely address this, and we will. In those two instances, we know exactly how many people checked in at that vote center. We can then check the total number of ballots that are that were uh, left there, either tabulated or in box three, and determine if they're the same. We can segregate those out and make a determination. And the best thing of all is that we will do this with the Republican and Democrat observers watching this to make sure that everything checks out. Again, the issue is every one of those votes is going to be counted the people uh, cast at the vote center. The only issue has been where they're being tabulated. They're at the vote center or here at Central Count. Furthermore, as to Blake Masters' suggestion that we should, quote, wipe the slate clean and start counting over again, that is simply not allowed for under Arizona law. Additionally, the suggestion by the Republican National Committee that there is something untoward going on here in Maricopa County is absolutely false and again is offensive to these good elections workers behind me who have been working 14 to 18 hour days every day now and they continue, they did it today on a holiday, Veterans Day, they'll continue to do it through a weekend through this temporary weekend and into early of next week. And as far as the allegation that this is taking too long, when we look back in the history books here, over the past couple of decades, on average, it takes 10 to 12 days to complete the count. That's not because of anything Maricopa County has decided to do. That's because of how Arizona law is set up. And that's what we do here at Maricopa County. We follow the law to make sure that the count is accurate. And just to note this, uh, Bill, that, that RNC statement was 
made uh, before CNN's projection. You're a Republican. Are you okay with the Republican Party, the National Republican Party, making these kinds of accusations? Well, I'm not okay with it because they're false. Uh, again, I would prefer that if there are concerns that they have, that they communicate those to us here. I'm a Republican. Three of my colleagues on the board are Republicans. Raise these issues with us, discuss them with us, as opposed to making these baseless claims. And again, they're, they're egging people on. They're hyping up the rhetoric here, which is exactly what we don't need to do. Mr. Gates, this is John King. Again, thank you for your time. I just want to make a point for what you're saying. Uh, the same things were done in 2020, and I've, what you caution people is don't believe what you hear on television. See if people can actually prove it where it matters. And when do you think we'll get the results from those remaining uncounted ballots? We will continue in the rhythm that we've now established over the past few days. I would anticipate, again, one uh, ballot drop or you know one vote update per day in the evening, probably somewhere in this range that we've been somewhere around 60 to 80,000 a day, which would then make us uh, reach completion very early next week. The bad, as I mentioned earlier, is we still don't know all the elect official election results. And the ugly media who predicted election results without having complete counts has now shifted their focus into fear-mongering the election process, branding into every viewer's brain that there's only two political parties and both of them are fighting fiercely for your support. American libertarian television presenter, author, consumer journalist, and pundit, John Stossel summed it up best in this Daily Citizens article. The good? We have a divided government. The bad? Prediction markets, which he touted as the best guide to elections? didn't do so well at predicting the outcome. And the ugly? Long-term incumbents once again are the winners of the race for re-election. Pat Murray, Mike Crapo, and Chuck Schumer, each with 29 years in public office. That's three decades holding office. And all three of them are 72 years old, starting another term in public office. Ron Eden and Chuck Grassley won too. 42 years in public office, over four decades for each of these people in public office. Here we have another 73-year-old senator, and Grassley is 89 years old, starting another six-year term in the U.S. Senate. If he lives long enough, he'll be 95 years old when he's up for re-election. <sighs> when are the people going to learn? Chuck Grassley was three months old when the 21st Amendment to the Constitution repealed prohibition, yet he has absolutely no problem with enacting prohibition on the single best way to quit smoking. Look at this. President Trump announced a plan today to ban all flavored e-cigarettes. KCCI's Max Deeknight joins us now, and Max, somebody very close to the president helped lead the charge on this, right? Yes, yeah, Steve, you're right. The first lady has been a very vocal opponent of e-cigarettes, citing concerns to children's health. Now, this ban would mean thousands of flavors of e-cigarettes that are believed to be marketed specifically for children will soon be off the market. This proposal comes following an outbreak of lung illnesses tied to vaping. The Iowa Department of Health recently confirmed eight cases of vaping-related respiratory illnesses in the state. They also reported that more than 22% of Iowa 11th graders use e-cigarettes. Today, we asked Iowa Senator and Republican Charles Grassley about this proposed ban. That's nice. Tell you whether or not it's enough, but I've read enough about uh, the deaths and the sickness that has happened from vaping and uh, 
Uh, I want uh, I want government to take action. Like I said, folks, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly this week. It wasn't nicotine vapes which caused Vapi, volley, volley lung injuries and the deaths that were associated with it. We all know it was vitamin E acetate used as a thickening agent by illicit THC vape cartridge manufacturers. The CDC states that vitamin E acetate is a very strong culprit of concern in Vapi, having been found in 29 of 29 lung biopsies tested from 10 different states. But evidence is not yet sufficient to rule out contribution of other chemicals of concern to VAPI. 29 out of 29 biopsies tests found vitamin E acetate, and it's still not yet sufficient to rule out contribution of other chemicals of concern. Are you kidding me? Over 82 million, think about this logically, over 82 million vapors worldwide use a nicotine vape to not smoke every single day on this planet. And they still keep pushing their false flag operation. How many smokers Cannabis and THC users need to die needlessly because the CDC and the federal government keep lying to the public and being merchants of doubt. 29 out of 29 cases. Like I said, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly this week. The good? Iowa passed an amendment protecting gun rights. Three states passed measures protecting reproductive freedom. Anti-abortion measures in two states lost. Maryland and Missouri legalized recreational weed. The bad? Well, recreational weed lost in Arkansas, North Dakota, and South Dakota. Sports gambling lost in California. And California also banned flavored electronic cigarettes, which will create a brand new criminal black market and result in more cigarette smokers, killing half of them. Seriously, I think the last one deserves to be called ugly. Let's be honest about that fact. California voters approve ban on sale of flavored tobacco products. <sighs> California voters on Tuesday passed a ballot measure to uphold a 2020 law that banned the sale of most flavored tobacco products, giving anti-tobacco activists an expected victory in a multi-year fight against the industry to mitigate a youth vaping crisis that we all know doesn't exist. Why is it that every single news article keeps regurgitating propaganda misnomers in a scripted word for word? The messaging is identical. Well, no matter how many websites or how many news articles you go to, it's sickening how identical the language is. This isn't news that we're watching and paying attention to anymore. It's propaganda and marketing. There is no youth vaping crisis. Youth vaping is down and has been falling for many years now. It was just a fad. And the continual lies by the media so-called public health officials and body part organizations are only going to drive smoking rates back up. That's disgusting. Nicotine vaping works because of the many, many flavors that we get to pick from. 
When you ban flavors, you remove the only thing which differentiates vaping from pharmaceutical nicotine replacement therapy, like a Nicotrol inhaler that I tried to use. And it was a total failure because as soon as I got done using that Nicotrol inhaler, I was 10 times more driven to light up a cigarette than before I had my smoke break. Why is common sense logic so hard to understand for people? There is no tobacco in most vaping liquids. The only reason that they can say that nicotine liquids are tobacco products is because they passed a federal law forcing all nicotine containing liquids intended for inhalation to be fined, to be defined as a tobacco product. They don't care how stupid it sounds or how many foods that we eat contain nicotine. Everybody is just expected to ignore common sense and call things what they're not. And for those of you that are brand new to the Global 20 or this channel, Senate Bill 793 was signed by Governor Gavin Newsom and now has been publicly decided on by ill-informed voters as Proposition 31, which means as soon as the tally is officially counted, well, 30 days, it's going to become law. Senate Bill 793 banned the sale of certain flavored tobacco products in stores and vending machines including menthol cigarettes, but made exceptions for hookah, premium cigars, and loose-leaf tobacco. So once again, the products which actually cause non-communicable disease and death is allowed to be sold everywhere. But the life-saving flavored vaping products which saves smokers' lives in California? Sorry, folks, that's illegal. You want a light-flavored tobacco on fire? Breathe that in using a hookah. California says that's no problem. You want to smoke a flavored cigar? That's no problem. You want to... Roll your own cigarettes using flavored loose leaf tobacco or throw it in a pipe? No problem. But if you want to quit smoking using a flavored vape, sorry, folks, that is now illegal in the state of California. You can smoke all the cannabis and marijuana you want but you're not allowed to legally buy the single best way to quit smoking. Sure, this makes all kinds of sense. Hello, black market. And hello, lawsuits. Tobacco companies sue California over flavored tobacco ban. Hours after voters approve it. R.J. Reynolds and other tobacco companies tried suing over the state's ban last year, but a judge told them to wait until after the referendum. They did, waiting less than a day. That is a big fat lie. Big Tobacco has been waiting for over two years since Governor Newsom signed Senate Bill 793 to have their day in court. So, unless a judge intervenes, well, the California flavor prohibition is set to go into effect December 21st of this year. So for those of you interested, the lawsuit argues that California State Bill 793 violates the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act of 2009's Express Preemption Clause which essentially prevents state requirements being different from or in addition to the federal law requirement 
about tobacco product standards. So, if the FDA authorizes a product like the Enjoy Ace, well, California is not allowed to prohibit the sale of it. It's that simple. And for those of you watching the news outside of the United States, Europe has also implemented a flavor ban of their own. Back in June, back in June when I was talking about the China flavor ban, you might have heard about Europe's beating cancer plan and the commission proposing to prohibit flavored heated tobacco products. Well, Tobacco Reporter just published EU HTP flavor ban to take effect November 23rd. On November 3rd, Tobacco Intelligence announced in the regulatory briefing Heated tobacco flavors ban is now official and will apply throughout the EU. The Publication of Commission Delegated Directive 2022-2100 follows the end of the scrutiny period of 29 October, during which neither the Council of European Union nor the European Parliament raised any objection to the ban. The directive also removes member states' right to grant heated tobacco products an exemption from the requirement to carry health warnings as smoking products. So even though heated tobacco products aren't actually lit on fire and smoked, they must now be called smoking products. And... They must also have all the warning labels. So people confusingly think that the health effects of lighting a cigarette on fire and using a heated tobacco product are the same. I'm sorry, folks, this really upsets me that we cannot follow common sense fundamental science and the results of that science to drive policies and, pr and procedures and government regulations around the globe. People are going to die needlessly because of these ridiculous regulations. Well, the directive will officially come into force on the 23rd of November. And the EU member states will have until the 23rd of July, 2023, to transpose it into their national legal frameworks. And just as California lawyers are mustering to fight the new law from going into effect, well, European members and their representatives are raising concerns over whether the European Commission was overstepping its delegated powers by introducing a new legal category of heated tobacco products. More recently, Bulgaria, Cyprus, Greece, and Italy issued a joint statement on the matter, saying that the introduction of the definition of heated tobacco products goes beyond the delegated power under Directive 2014-40-EU and involves essential elements reserved for the European legislators and as such should be submitted to the ordinary legislative review process. I know. There's links in the description if you want to try digging further into the flavor ban in Europe. Fortunately, Article 20 of the Tobacco Products Directive lays down rules for electronic cigarettes that are sold as consumer electronic products in the European Union. So as far as I can tell, while the creation of heated tobacco products definition could easily be interpreted to encompass electronic cigarettes and their liquids. It's a separate category. And being that electronic cigarettes is a separate category already on the books means that the new flavor ban only applies to heated tobacco and not electronic cigarettes. But that isn't going to stop lawyers from bringing suits and challenging things. I guarantee it. Law Street Media reports 
Magellan sues FDA over vape registration petition denials. Magellan Technology Incorporated and Vapor Train 2 LLC filed a complaint against the Food and Drug Administration for unjustly denying Magellan's 12 pre-market tobacco product applications. They allege that the organizations did not give Magellan the proper tracking numbers. So Magellan could not properly link any supplemental documentation that the FDA asked for. As they keep changing the forms required for a complete application. This one's actually really interesting, folks, to follow because the company states that they filed all the required PMTA paperwork, but the FDA didn't bother to look at the entire application because, well, the FDA kind of forgot to provide the required tracking numbers that had to be included in their newly minted PMTA supplemental information forms. It's kind of like, oh, I don't know, maybe the FDA designed this whole PMTA process to guarantee that absolutely no one except mega corporations like Enjoy, who, by the way, had a team of FDA representatives double-checking things with them, would ever be able to submit a complete application. Since when did it become a requirement to have a team of lawyers submit a federal application? Pretty obvious that if you have a team of lawyers working on your application, well, then the FDA is going to provide a team of FDA representatives to keep track of all your paperwork and all the efforts of that whole team of people. Yeah, like that's almost an efficient way to regulate harm reduction products. Sorry, I'm not even going to get into that because the small businesses are the ones that had absolutely no chance to compete in any of this. Sorry, small businesses. We at the FDA don't want to work with you, so... You can't dedicate millions of dollars to pay for teams of lawyers, teams of scientists, teams of PR staff to call out the FDA for ghosting your application after it enters the FDA's regulatory abyss. Sorry, small businesses, don't bother. Only multinational corporations are allowed to flourish with the U.S. FDA. Honestly, folks, I think that the Small Business Administration even called out the FDA for blatantly disregarding the 300 small businesses, who, by the way, aren't little mom and pop operations either. All of those small businesses couldn't even afford to legally fill out the forms, let alone afford a team of scientists to do research studies on each and every single product and every single nick level. Anyway, Magellan states that they included identifying information to tie the applications together. But when the FDA refused to accept Magellan's permits, it appeared all the paperwork was not properly aggregated. Talk about not having an assorted filing system. Magellan further, further alleges that the FDA incorrectly assumed that their bi-language manufacturing documents, which were originally in Mandarin, were then unverifiably translated into English. So I guess the FDA expects you to also have a certified professional team of translators and a team of public notaries to certify that the language translations were verifiably translated into English. I don't know what FDA regulation that decision was based off of. Verifiable translation? What? It's no wonder Jewel was on the verge of bankruptcy. 
Jewel discusses a possible bailout with two of its biggest investors. Vaping Company explores investment with directors Nick Pritzker and Riaz Valani. That would avoid the bankruptcy filing. Not only did they discuss the investment, but got the capital investment and the capital funds needed to keep Jewel alive and fight the FDA's terrible decisions, like banning the most popular quit smoking tool on the planet. Jewels are for fools. At least that's what the feds want you to think. Uh, the F FDA announcing today they are officially banning Juul devices and pods. Not all vapes, just Juuls. Willy-nilly, the company says they are planning to appeal. Their chief regulatory officer said in a statement, quote, we respectfully disagree with the FDA's findings and decision and continue to believe we have provided sufficient information and data based on high-quality research to address all issues raised by the agency, end quote. Now, don't get me wrong. Smoking's not good for you, but people are still going to get their hands on vapes, and they could end up with very dangerous knockoffs. Does the ban achieve anything? Joining me now to discuss Cato Institute senior fellow. He is a practicing general surgeon. Dr. Jeffrey Singer is uh, is here. Welcome to the show, Dr. Singer. Great to see you. Hi, Kennedy. Uh, I Hi, think Kennedy. this is a horrible idea. I think it is not only dangerous for kids who will be the first ones to find the very dangerous knockoffs. It's bad for adults who are going to be forced to smoke low nicotine cigarettes, which means they'll just smoke more of them and get cancer faster. What are you seeing with this ruling? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, it's interesting that they banned one of the most popular brands, vaping brands, at the same time they cleared the way for its two biggest competitors, both of which are owned by tobacco companies. Now, you know, the cynic in me might make me suspect cronyism, but the doctor in me is upset because it looks like the FDA has lost all interest in tobacco-related harm reduction. The vaping products have been shown in study after study to be really effective means of getting people who want to quit tobacco smoke off of tobacco smoke. It's been more effective than nicotine patches, nicotine gum. And in fact, in the, in the UK, Public Health England asks its primary care doctors to tell their patients who smoke cigarettes to consider moving over to vaping and hands them out bro brochures. So here we have... The FDA, in its, I, I can't call it its wisdom, deciding that they want to make it, remove one of the most popular and established brands from the market, making it even harder for people who want to vape to get the products that they like to use. And as far as reducing the nicotine content of cigarettes, which is another one of their plans, you know, nicotine by itself, that's the substance that does the addicting, but it's the other pro com components of the smoke that does the harm, that can causes cancer, high blood pressure, et cetera. And, and heart disease. Um, but nicotine is relatively harmless. It's sort of like caffeine. It's a stimulant, but it also has a calming effect. And, and many people smoke for the nicotine effect. Oh, so yes. if you reduce the nicotine content, uh, in fact, the, the government funded studies that mm -hmm. the FDA wanted and based their decision on showed that when they reduce the nicotine content, people take longer drags of the cigarette and take more cigarettes because they're smoking of to get the desired result. Of course they do, because they want, they want sure. the nicotine, obviously. Um, I, I have a feeling it was it was some nosy Nancy calling the president a big donor, like, my child is vaping, Mr. President. You have to ban it. And he's like, okay, I'll tell the FDA. They're dumb. They're not doing anything except for screwing up what's left of the pandemic response. Uh, and, and vaping has helped a lot of people get off cigarettes. We have 450,000 cigarette deaths every year in this country alone. That in and of itself is a pandemic, but prohibition doesn't work. At least vaping is an alternative to get people away from the thing that's, that's giving them heart disease and cancer. Exactly. And, and actually, uh, in certain regions of the country where municipalities or states have clamped down on the availability of different vaping products, studies are now showing, in fact, the Yale University study is showing that tobacco consumption is going back up because the people who were enjoying vaping, uh, they can't get the vaping products they want. So I don't understand. There's no logic here. If the FDA says it's concerned about public health, this is the opposite of public health. Yes, and, and tobacco use rates have been declining for years. Uh, we have a lot of problems right now, and it, it seems like a very odd place for the federal government to be focusing their attention. Are there any benefits to nicotine? 
asking for a friend. Um, actually, there's research being done uh, that nicotine actually may be useful for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. Uh, there's other research that might be helpful in certain psychiatric diseases. Mm -hmm. it, it's a uh, like like any other stimulant, if you take too much of it, you can get to toxic levels, just like you can get to toxic levels of caffeine. And Red But Bull. like Public Health England says, it's a relatively harmless product. But the the the, uh, the sensations that it gives the user is what makes the user uh, want, get addicted, have a tendency to get addicted to it. Yeah. So yeah. they're going to get like addicted to people... anything. So what would you rather have them be addicted right. to? Uh, being sedentary. Fat smokers or very excited, soothed nicotine addicts? I know I would choose the latter. Uh, we've run out of time. Dr. Singer in the Woods, you are fantastic. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you, you very do. much. He's a great Thank champion. You. Finally, we have some positive nationwide conversations about the benefits of vaping, the benefits of nicotine, and how harmful the FDA's decisions have been for public health. Unfortunately, that didn't stop Jewel from also cutting 400 jobs amid the growing setbacks. Jewel said it has obtained new financing to stay in business and continue operations, which includes challenging plans by the Food and Drug Administration to ban its products. The layoffs include 400 staffers and are part of a cost saving plan to immediately cut Jewel's operating budget by 30 to 40 percent, according to a person familiar with the plan, who requested anonymity to discuss its details. The new cash infusion came from two early Jewel investors, Nicholas Pritzker, head of Hyatt Hotels, and Riaz Valani, a private equity specialist based in San Francisco, according to the same person. For weeks, industry analysts have speculated that Jewel could soon declare bankruptcy or sell itself to another company. Thursday's announcement appears to have at least delayed any move in that direction. This investment will allow Jewel Labs to maintain business operations, continue advancing its administrative appeal of the FDA's marketing denial, and support product innovation and science generation. A company spokesperson wrote in an email. And you know what? America isn't the only country seeing lawsuits fighting government agencies for vaping and tobacco harm reduction. The Korea Electronic Cigarette Association, KECA, a group of about 4,000 e-cigarette vendors, said that it has filed a lawsuit against the Ministry of Health and Welfare and the Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency demanding that the government correct misguided information about electronic cigarettes. The KECA believes that the government health agencies damaged the reputation of small e-cigarette business owners and caused financial problems by distributing a press release recommending Koreans stop using liquid electronic cigarettes on October 23rd of 2019. According to the U.S. FDA's notice, which banned the sale of liquid type e-cigarettes, which was based the basis of MOHW's decision that advises smokers to stop using electronic cigarettes. Tetrahydrocannabinol, a hemp-derived substance, was the main problem, said the KECA. The Korean lawsuit also calls out other common misinformation unjustly igniting fears of vaping and shed light on the most important vaping facts. According to the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety, test results in 2017, very low levels of harmful ingredients were detected in liquid electronic cigarettes compared to tobacco. KECA said notably tar and carbon monoxide were not detected at all and formaldehyde was only at 120th level, and acetaldehyde at 1 500th level compared to regular cigarettes. It's common sense, backed by science, folks. Research from the United States, Britain, Germany, and Australia recognizes the efficacy of electronic cigarettes for smoking cessation. 
with a success rate of 65% and no increase in respiratory risk. Recently, Germany conducted a study on whether electronic cigarettes can effectively assist smoking cessation. The study, published in the German medical journal Deutsches Astrablatt, tracked 2,740 smokers aged 14 to 96 with big data and found that electronic cigarettes are far more effective in quitting smoking than other methods. Second study, conducted by 19 researchers of different nationalities and published in the journal Addiction, included 3,516 smokers in Australia, the United Kingdom, Canada, and the United States. The authors noted in the article that among all study participants, smokers were seven times more likely to quit smoking using e-cigarettes than those who were not trying e-cigarettes. In fact, Many national scientific research institutions have previously confirmed the effectiveness of electronic cigarettes for smoking cessation. Back in 2016, a UK study confirmed that it was more effective in quitting smoking, and three years later, Public Health England reported that it had a quit success rate between 59.7 and 74%, the highest of all alternatives. U.S. researchers also came to the exact same conclusion. The success rate of smoking cessation, 65.1%. And in Australia, researchers mentioned that the average success rate of quitting smoking with electronic cigarettes was 96% compared to quitting without any help. In addition, 22 researchers from several universities and research centers in the United States conducted a new study on the relationship between smoking and respiratory symptoms in the adults. To do this, they recruited 16,295 adults from the Population Assessment of Tobacco and Health Stur Survey. That's the PATH survey, which is jointly conducted by the National Institutes of Health and the FDA. They grouped groups of people who used various products. Cigarettes, cigars, hookahs, electronic cigarettes, etc. The conclusion drawn from their data, from their study, show that with the exception of e-cigarettes, people who use all types of products, including cigarettes, have a higher risk of respiratory symptoms. In most cases, those who use exclusively electronic cigarettes did not cause an increased respiratory risk. In other words... Vapors and non-smokers have the same risk of respiratory symptoms. This tells a person with any common sense whatsoever that even dual use is a benefit for a smoker. Because every single puff that you do not take on a combustible tobacco product results in less tar, less carbon monoxide, less cancer-causing substances being absorbed into that person's body. Well, guess what, folks? We finally have a study saying exactly that. Biomarkers of potential harm in people switching from smoking tobacco to exclusive e-cigarette use, dual use, or abstinence. Secondary analysis of Cochrane Systematic Review of trials of e-cigarettes for smoking cessation. What a mouthful of a title. But the conclusion of this study is that switching from smoking to vaping or switching from smoking to dual use appears to reduce levels of biomarkers of potential harm significantly. It just, it doesn't just reduce biomarkers of harm, it appears to reduce biomarkers of potential harm significantly. It's common sense. Why can't people understand that? Every single puff you don't take on a combustible cigarette and you choose to take it on an electronic cigarette is a benefit for your overall health outcome. And there's already studies out there we've talked about that say the more you use an electronic cigarette, the more likely you are to never touch 
a combustible cigarette. You can only keep saying the same things over and over again. It's fundamental science and it's common sense. And it's fantastic news that should be aired on every media outlet across the globe. Followed by a statement that all cigarette sales will end by the end of the year. And vaping products are now going to be sold excise tax free. All right, all right, all right. Maybe that's asking a little too much. However, this next bit is a reality, and it's a fact. Um, excuse me, please, Mr. Waiter. Can you please make me a coffee and get me an electronic cigarette, too? Please? I'm not kidding, folks. This one is straight from Sky Vape Italy. And we find electronic cigarettes... Even bars will be able to sell them. Waiter, please make me a coffee and give me an e-cigarette too. A scenario which we will have to get used to in our dear Italy by now. Credit, courtesy also in this case of Italian Customs and Monopolies Agency. With the director's determination issued yesterday, in fact, the number of businesses that will be able to sell electronic cigarettes and related liquids has been expanded. The act of Marcello Minena, in fact, recognizes this possibility for activities that have a license, not exactly a novelty for our system. The license, in fact, is an institution provided for by law 1293 of 1957. It allows certain type of businesses, typically bars, to be able to sell cigarettes and tobaccos in general, despite not having a tobacco license. So in Italy, you can sell electronic cigarettes without any special license. In fact, Director Marcello Menena, number one of the Customs and Monopoly Agency, explained the act as a need to expand the network of legal trade and thus to counter the rampant phenomenon of smuggling of disposable electronic cigarettes given an objective growth in the recent weeks. So in Italy, their customs director recognized the common sense solution to the rampant black market smuggling of disposables and is going to allow the disposables to be legally sold everywhere. What a fantastic idea. If it's legally sold everywhere, well, then the consumers get to buy a safe, unadulterated vape product and not smoke. The drug cartels, well, they're going to lose out. The black market has absolutely no purpose now. It was going to dry up. And most importantly, smokers get to switch to the most effective smoking cessation tool ever created on this planet. I'm telling you, this idea would never work in America. In fact, Michigan wants to ensure that they implement a law to guarantee the government knows every single shop and every single place of business that ever makes contact with a vape to sell it. Welcome Senate Bill 575, entitled the Youth Tobacco Act. <sighs> An act to prohibit the selling, giving, or furnishing of tobacco products, vapor products, and alternative nicotine products to minors. To prohibit the purchase, possession, or use of tobacco products, vapor products, and alternative nicotine products by minors to regulate the retail sale of tobacco products, vapor products, alternative nicotine products, and liquid nicotine containers to require the registration of vapor products to regulate the licensed persons to manufacture and persons that sell tobacco products, vapor products, blah, 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 blah. Holy moly. This is horrible. Because if you're a parent in Michigan and you find your child smoking a combustible cigarette, you will now be breaking the law if you furnish them a vaping product 
to reduce the harm your child is doing to themselves. Someone, please, explain to me how this law makes any sense whatsoever. You cannot group all tobacco products with vaping products. Science clearly shows us they are not the same thing. Tobacco combustion kills half of all users. And nicotine vaping has yet to kill anyone with 82 million people on the planet using it every single day. One product saves lives, and the other one only kills lives. Please, for the love of humanity, stop treating vaping like smoking. Vaping isn't smoking. Vaping is, by definition, not smoking. This law makes no sense whatsoever. Because if you read all of it, you come to find out it's even worse. Vapor product means a non-combustible product that employs a heating element, power source, electronic circuit, or other electronic, chemical, or mechanical means, regardless of shape or size, that can be used to produce vapor from nicotine or any other substance. Well, other than marijuana and the use or inhalation of which simulates smoking. So, if you want to vape or sell or manufacture a marijuana vaping product, this law does not apply to you. Vapor product also does not include a product regulated as a drug or device by the United States Food and Drug Administration. Yeah, so this, so here we go in Michigan. Michigan allows an 18-year-old to recreationally smoke marijuana from a dispensary, but if that 18-year-old smoker wants to stop smoking either marijuana or tobacco, well, they have to wait until they're 21 to legally use a vape to quit smoking. Sorry, folks, that is the definition of the ugliest ugly for this week. The law requires your vape contain cannabis or it's a regulated illegal product for anyone under the age of 21. And you can thank these Democrats, Marshall Bullock, Sean McCain, Jim McAnich, Paul Wajno, and these Republicans, Rick Ottman and John Bizen, for this atrocious piece of hypocrite legislation. Fortunately, it hasn't been enacted into law yet. But just give them time, folks. And I guarantee you, once we all look away because we're focused on something else, they'll make it a law. And people in Michigan are going to be stuck with it. <sighs> all right, all right, all right. So with all that debauchery out of the way, how about we move on to some positive industry news? Oral nicotine products lead the U.S. smokeless tobacco market. Sales of the overall smokeless subcategory grew almost 6% in the United States convenience stores. Listen, I said it was positive news. I didn't say it was going to be fantastic or exciting. How about this one? Geek Vape to launch new disposable vape brand, Geek Bar, in the Philippines. Recently, Geek Vape hosted an industry party in Manila, Philippines, with great success announcing the official debut of the new disposable vape brand, Geek Bar, that garnered interest in the country's e-cigarette sector. The event was witnessed by local key opinion leaders, Geek Bar partners, and Filipino fans. And it was highly entertaining. Geek Vape also 
held an online technical seminar to explore technologies used in the e-cigarette. On November 10th, 2022, Geek Vape, one of the world's best vapor brands, and One Shot Media, a well-known French media outlet, co-hosted an online seminar on electronic cigarette technology with the theme, Leap Further, to explore new trends in the advancement of the e-cigarette technology. The seminar invited industry experts to discuss technological progress and innovation in the industry based on four topics, user concerns, structural design of atomizers, battery cells, chips, and future development. Clicking on the link takes us to their Facebook page where you can go and watch the presentation in its entirety. Personally, I think it was a fantastic geeky way to dive into the technological process and innovation that we find in all of our vaping products today. From airflow analysis and design to battery and mod output analysis, this presentation scientifically looked at how and why your vaping products just keep getting better and better. They literally measure and test all aspects of their products to ensure that customer satisfaction is always going to be maximized. And this, folks, is why, generally speaking, coils don't leak anymore. They found out the exact right silicone gasket material and the perfect top airflow design to suppress bottom flow airflow flavor capacity. <sighs> Sorry, I get excited. I, I, I nerded out on this video, okay? Computer-generated modeling allows them to test and optimize airflow designs before making a single product. The video is an hour long. And I have to say, it's only for the geekiest vapors out there because it is pretty technical stuff. And a little slow bit pace because it literally show you testing the mod outputs and calculating, you know, the actual wattage that you get kind of inspires me to do a little more testing on some of the stuff that I actually go and do. All right, one more bit of industry news. And then I'm going to tell you about a harm reduction scholarship opportunity. Zuvu Drag Bar Z7000GT, the next big thing in vaping. At Zuvu, we are excited to bring the latest in disposable technology to the vaping world. The Zuvu Drag Bar Z7000GT. This device is an ultra thin, stylish device with a powerful 300 milliamp hour battery. The device is available in eye-watering 100 flavors. This device is 2 mil in capacity and 2% nicotine salt, making it completely TPD legal. But due to its brand new ceramic coil technology, it produces a whopping 700 puffs. I know, I know, I know. You're all out there yelling at the TV or yelling at your phone going, we don't care about another disposable. Is that the only industry news you got? Can you move on to something else if that's it? Hold on, folks. Hold on, folks. I have got an exciting announcement. Listen, you all know, Oxva. I love Oxva. From the day I first laid my hands on one of their products, I still say the Arbiter is the best RTA ever made. I've got six of them, and I use them all. Kind of wish I could use them all at the same time, but that'd be a little ridiculous. Anyway, I logged on to YouTube today, and they're like, listen, it's your, it's your birthday. It's your celebratory birthday. You've been on the platform, you know, the anniversary. Oxva is just now celebrating its three-year anniversary. 11-11 officially marks three years coming up with the best design products in the vaping industry. That's just my opinion. 
but I honestly am surprised every time they send or they come out with a new product. I just can't get over how much better this stuff is than when I first tried to quit smoking. So how about we take a quick jump over and take a look at what we can find out about the news. I can't show you the links, but since this is the news, well, you can watch me research the news. Let's check this out. There you go. It's that simple. All you gotta do is use your favorite browser and search for Oxford third anniversary. And guess what? You can find all the information about their wonderful anniversary celebration. They've even got a contest going on. Oh, let me tell you. Here's from their blog. Founded in 11 November 2019, Oxford is a professional fast-growing brake vaping market established during the pandemic. Under the leadership of Justin Lai, Oxo builds up a team with 100 plus passionate team members specializing in product development and marketing from around a thousand employees working on the production lines. Oxo's vision is to be the most innovative vape brand with the best flavor. Therefore, Oxo has never stopped pursuing innovation. In the past three years, Oxo has accomplished more than 200 patents awarded by the government with Shenzhen High Tech Enterprise Certification. Meanwhile, Arbiter 2 won the title Best RTA, while the product Exlim won the title Best Pod. That's what I thought, too. Best Pod of 2022. And I'm in good company there, Issa Click. Yeah. Anyway... Sorry, guys. I, I really, truly love Oxa stuff. I can't show you the thing, the links. But you can go check them out on Instagram. You can go check them out on Facebook. You can go check them out on TikTok. Whatever floats your boat. The one thing I do want to show you is I do want to show you they have a YouTube channel. And they want to thank all of you. All right, all right, all right. I'm not going to show you the whole thing. But it just, it flabbergasted me watching this. You know, how many other vape companies out there do you see out there celebrating their anniversary and literally publishing out there, showing all their employees, showing them walking through their warehouses and stuff? That's a class act right there. Anyway, I think it's time we move on because I do have a scholarship opportunity for tobacco harm reduction that I need to show you next. Here you go, folks. Let's take a look at their website, thrsp.net. It's the Tobacco Harm Reduction Scholarship Program. The Tobacco Harm Reduction Scholarship Program is the jewel in the crown for knowledge action change. Launched in 2018, the program has had an unprecedented global impact with scholars on six continents completing a wide range of successful projects. We have already built an extensive new network of advocates raising awareness of tobacco harm reduction around the world. And this report tells the story of our progress during the first three years of our program. Fantastic. Go check out the website but I do need to state the obvious. This wouldn't be an advocacy-based news program if I didn't keep reiterating and regurgitating the same facts that we all know. Globally, 1.1 billion people continue to smoke. 80% live in lower and middle income countries, least able to support people who quit or to treat smoking related diseases. And every single year, there are 8 million smoking related deaths worldwide. More people die prematurely from smoking than from AIDS, 
malaria, and tuberculosis combined. But despite millions spent on tobacco control efforts, the number of smokers is the same as it was 20 years ago. While prevalence rates have declined in some countries, populations have increased, and the urgent need for a solution is very clear. Tobacco harm reduction using safer nicotine products has the potential to help millions of smokers move away from smoking. So, if you know of a student looking for a scholarship opportunity, well, go point them to this website and have them apply to see if they can get awarded this scholarship opportunity. And yes, as you can clearly see, if you look on the website, this scholarship is provided or funded by a grant from the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. And yes, that is big tobacco money doing more good than tobacco control and all public entities combined. In fact, they've gone so far as <sighs> once again, the original story that I'm just getting ready to talk about was published in the New York Times. And let me tell you, folks, it was a fantastic read talking about how for decades, for decades, public health advocates chipped away at the influence of big tobacco with measures aimed at discouraging cigarette use. But the bitter and political battles were just the prelude to the unfolding climatic clash that would determine the fate of smoking and whether these companies adapt or falter. This prophetic, almost poetically written prose took a deep dive into how and why big tobacco must and eventually will globally eliminate smoking while simultaneously meeting their fiduciary duty to big tobacco shareholders. It talked about public health, it talked about the FDA, and it talked about how every single stakeholder requires big tobacco to make this inevitable transformation away from combustion that we see unfolding day after day. What was once a budding market of sigil likes blossomed into an avalanche-sized smoking cessation mass miracle. And this is all but synergistically killed off smoking and is still transforming all industry players for the global public health benefit that the society always wanted and so desperately needs today. So, while Big Tobacco was diligently working on heat not burn technology, well, <laughs> along come the consumers who unexpectedly chose the fledgling vapor technology, and they ran with it. Why'd they run with it? Because the consumers didn't need a scientist to tell them what their body felt like as soon as they switched from smoking to vaping. The smoker's cough disappeared twice as fast as when they tried to quit with any other method. And the amazing, delectable flavors ensured that all quitters remained combustion-free. So all of a sudden, ex-smokers by the droves were opening up shops on every available sneak corner, exponentially increasing the number of smokers, successfully stopping their smoking habit. I mean, seriously, folks, if legislators and regulatory agencies would have just left things alone, advocates like me would be going after the few remaining smokers instead of fighting to bring real-world science and facts onto the regulatory battlegrounds by enlisting people like you watching this to the very end 
to go advocate for tobacco harm reduction because vaping is that successful and works that well. It truly was one, probably one of the best articles that I've ever read from the New York Times. But alas, their corporate greed running countless advertisements ran its course. And now they want me to subscribe to show you the amazing article that my brain bathed in while I read their story. Sorry, New York Times, but your greed is the same corporate greed holding back big tobacco from expediting this life-saving transformation that we call vaping. On a positive note though, Ooh, more science. We'll get to that in a minute. On a positive note, though, they went and ranked all big tobacco companies' progress towards harm reduction. Here we go. Found in Nature News, we see the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World Tobacco Transformation Index report finds that the 15 largest tobacco companies are delivering differentiated but limited progress towards harm reduction. After conducting more than two years of research into efforts of the world's 15 biggest tobacco companies to reduce the harm of their products, the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World has published the second edition of their Tobacco Transformation Index. Accessible here. Very nice. So let's take a look at the results, shall we? In first place, no surprise, is Swedish Match. Followed by Philip Morris International, Altria Group, and British American Tobacco. In the twos, we find Imperial Brands, Japan Tobacco Group, and KT&G Group. The ones include Swisher and ITC Limited. That's a big tobacco company formerly known as Indian Tobacco. I guess they were inspired by Prince. Anyway, Moving backwards in time are all the remaining companies that scored less than one. Most notably, China National Tobacco Corporation, who, by the way, in case you didn't know, banned all flavored vapes from their very own country, forcing millions of Chinese smokers back to combustible tobacco or settling for only tobacco-flavored vaping products. And I'm not even going to mention the other ones because I'm sure you've never heard of them before. But notice on this graph who is lobbying and working on advocacy to end cigarette smoking. Notice how China Tobacco hasn't bothered with any advocacy, yet they make most of the vaping products used around the globe. And you wonder why the vaping landscape looks like it does. Sorry, folks. I know exactly how long this video is already. But it's still something that I'm very passionate about. So, here's one more science bit that you should know. All right? The study is titled, E-Cigarette Addiction and Harm Perception. Does Initiation Flavor Choice Matter? In other words, are all these flavor bands actually going to work? Is flavors really what drive kids to try vaping? Well, conclusion of this study states, traditionally, flavored e-cigarette initiation produces similar risk for addiction and harm perceptions as non-traditionally flavored initiation. These findings suggest that banning non-traditional flavors alone 
may be ineffective at curbing e-cigarette addiction and harm perception. Yeah, another lackluster common sense statement from a scientist. But the fact of the matter is, flavor bans don't work to stop youth initiation because it's not the reason that these kids find addiction. When I started smoking, we had no flavored cigarettes. I wasn't interested in the menthol. I started with plain tobacco flavor. And guess what? Many other people did too. For generations, people have been using tobacco flavor to get hooked on cigarettes. So flavors are not an issue on why people start smoking or start using vaping products. However, I can say with absolute certainty, the flavors do result in adults quitting smoking. And I'd be willing to say that it's at least 80% of why vaping is so effective for smoking cessation. And it's also why Disposable products are so popular and why they have become the dominant product for the vaping industry. Love them or hate them, they work. And they keep smokers quitting in droves. So, how about one last article before we wrap this up for today? Let's move smokers toward less harmful alternatives by Andy Krieger. This year, the Colorado State Legislature chose not to act on a bill that would have banned the sale of flavored nicotine products. This followed a trend in which a growing number of city governments in Colorado have also rejected nicotine flavor bans. In the past couple of years, the city councils of Golden, Loveland, and even Denver have voted down proposed nicotine flavor bans. Elected officials in Colorado have rightly concluded that a nicotine flavor ban would be ineffective and would disproportionately harm small business owners and adult consumers. Now it's time for policymakers to incorporate tobacco harm reduction into their public health strategy. Prohibition doesn't work. One has to only look at federal government's decades-long war on drugs to see that any type of tobacco prohibition is doomed to fail. Banning certain tobacco products will not stop the demand for them. That's fundamental economics. And the rest of the article keeps saying what I've been saying since the very first video on this channel. It makes absolutely no sense why the single best way to quit smoking is being banned and why merchants of doubt persist in convincing people that vaping might harm you. 82 million of us use this every single day to not smoke. There have been people using this since it first was invented well over a decade ago. Can we finally focus on the big picture? Smoking kills 8 million lives every single year. Vaping saves lives because tobacco harm reduction works. Focus on the big picture. Save smokers' lives now. Worry about the what-ifs and maybes after we've eliminated tobacco combustion. Sorry, but Rip Trippers was right. Smoking is done. Vaping is the future, and the future is now. Well, that wraps up the Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy News for the week ending November 11th, 2022. Please feel free to leave a comment below and let me know what you guys think. The next step should be for us advocating for tobacco harm reduction. And I also want to sincerely thank all of you for watching. And my wish is always peace, love, and a hunky vape to end cigarette combustion. Have a fantastic day.